the telephone call that wouldn't go through. These past recent days, handling problems related to the earthquake disaster, I've really had my fill of troubles and pressure. It is only natural that I've been feeling uncomfortable, and that I hoped so badly to receive comfort from others. Late into the night, I've made a number of telephone calls, just needing to talk. If anyone could offer a few words of comfort, I have felt great relief. Early this morning, I drove from the residence of the president of Jinan International University to the administration building. When I arrived at the administration building, I found the front door had not been opened yet. I glanced at my wristwatch. It said it was 7:30 in the morning. It seemed odd that the worker who opened that door every day hadn't shown up yet. But I was also in for another surprise. Why hadn't the usual daily newspapers arrived? I used my swipe card to let myself into the front door of the administration building. An hour passed, and I realized the building was incredibly quiet. How could this be? Usually by this hour, the building was full of people. My secretary had never been late before. My student assistant had never been late before. I waited till 8:45, and still there was no sign of life in the building. I looked out my office window, and I couldn't see a single soul or car anywhere on campus. The strangest thing of all was the national flag had not yet been hoisted on the flagpole. I decided to do a little investigating. I left my office. I looked all over that building. I found there wasn't a single person anywhere in sight. I drove over to one of the student dormitories. The front entrance was closed, but it was not locked. I walked inside and found the entire dormitory empty. There was no sign of blankets on the beds. There were no computers, bookshelves, or racks to be seen. The closet in every room was totally empty. As I strolled out of the dormitory. I saw no bicycles or motorcycles or cars near the entrance. I went to the College of Education for a look around there, and couldn't find a single vehicle parked before any of the buildings. The only thing I could find was a flock of little egrets. It was nine o'clock in the morning at that point, and every classroom was empty. At the guard's office in the front entrance of the university. The door was tightly locked. No wonder I thought that the national flag hadn't yet been raised. But I recalled how yesterday one of the guards waved a greeting my way as I passed through the entrance in my car. I suddenly thought of how, when I returned to the campus the night before, the wife of a professor had waved at me. So I sped to the faculty housing area. What really frightened me was that not even one car was parked there. The night before, I had seen a bunch of cars parked in that spot. I remembered too the throng of children playing in front of the dormitory. Now those children were nowhere to be seen, and there wasn't a sign of life in the entire housing district. I headed back to my office, and once there, felt the weight of more and more sadness. If in handling the earthquake disaster I had not responded so very well to the situation, still it was a fact the students and professors, my colleagues and so on, should not have treated me so harshly, so unjustly. Now it was 9:30 a.m. I resolved to call an old friend. I hoped for a word of comfort from him. I picked up the receiver and found there was no dial tone. I tried several times, but that was the way it was. I turned on the radio. There was no radio station to listen to. I turned on the television. There was no TV station to watch. In those moments, I'd have given all I had for someone to give me a little comfort, 
but clearly that was simply impossible. Then, all of a sudden something came to my mind. I thought of a clerk in the academic affairs office. His house had collapsed. A residence worth 8 million Taiwan dollars had gone down the tube like dishwater. And he himself had pawed his way out from beneath the ruins, nearly buried in bricks, tiles, and assorted rubble. It occurred to me that he surely longed for people to comfort him. But because I had been too busy with all I had to do, I hadn't personally extended a shred of comfort to him. Having been through this experience that morning, I had a clearer understanding of his suffering. I decided to call him. I reached for the telephone receiver and then put it back down. The call wouldn't be able to go through, would it? But I wanted to try anyway. The telephone rang. That really caught me off guard. My colleague was just getting ready to climb into his car to come to work. He was so happy to see that I was concerned about him. I also thought of a student whose mother had been seriously ill. I decided to give him a call to check on his situation. This time again, the call went through. Just as I was ending that conversation, a student assistant strolled in. I said to him, Young man, don't you know it's already 10 o'clock? A look of confusion swept over the student's face. He pointed to the clock on the wall and said to me, President Lee, what did you just say? I turned around and looked and saw it was only 7.30. I stood up and looked out the window. I discovered the flag had been raised. Cars and motorcycles were buzzing around campus. I spotted a strong, burly young fellow out for a jog. I grabbed the student assistant and told him to go with me to the student dormitory district. I found most of the students fast asleep. A smattering of students already up and about waved and greeted me. I dashed over to the guard's gate. They invited me to drink morning tea with them. I went to the faculty housing area and saw that many colleagues were busy dispatching their children to schools. The wife of a professor invited me to sit down at their family table for breakfast. My student assistant was completely in the dark about all this business. He was too young and had no way to understand it. I resolved to put this amazing experience into writing. In the future, if he would ever have a day when he hoped other folks would offer a little comfort to him, he'd be sure to find the dial tone on his telephone receiver silent and his friends nowhere to be seen. He would be wise to find a way to give comfort to someone else. All he need do was find a way to show some comfort to someone else. That would be the moment of the great discovery. His telephone would ring and his true friends would all come back to him.